Uh, well, again, thank you for being here. Um, we're very excited to be here in Boston. And I'm very excited uh, to be talking with you a little bit more about Particles product, um, some, some, you know, building on the narrative that, that uh, Zach uh, left, us, left us with, building for today's problems and then growing into new opportunities in the future, and to talk about how Particle is delivering new capabilities as a part of our platform that better equip you as a product creator um, to, to making that transition. So I want to also start by sharing what we see as our mission as Particle, which is to make it easier for customers to build and deploy IoT products that solve real problems and create real value. And so when we talk about the product roadmap for Particle, it's, it's all really delivered through this lens. We want to make it easier for customers to build and deploy IoT products which means that product creators need access to powerful tools that allow them to build powerful experiences easily, quickly. And as a company, we are laser focused on helping cut through the, the hype in the industry and really focusing on what's actually going on, solving real problems that create real value. And one of the ways that we do that is by arming you with key differentiating technologies that allow you to, again, deliver on today's value, but grow that solution uh, in the future as well. So the things we're going to be talking about today are different uh, product initiatives that are either, again, have been recently delivered as a part of our platform or will be delivering in the near future that span from the cloud side, fleet management, to connectivity, and then finally, our hardware. So I want to start with fleet management because really this is one of the most uh, important areas to evolving and improving IoT products over time. So again, why is fleet management important? It connects back to this narrative, right? Building for today's problems, designing for tomorrow's opportunities, and it is it, one, of the, one of the key benefits of connected products is this idea of iteration, of growth, of improvement. Um, but this hasn't always been the case for hardware products. And for many companies, this really represents a deviation from, you know, normal in the hardware world. So in software development, there's this idea of continuous delivery, that you can put a product out in market, you can learn, you can improve it, you can test improvements, maybe across, you know, you can do A-B testing to figure out uh, which changes will have the biggest impact for your business. And then once you've settled on a right set of improvements, you can put those, you can add those to the product. You can see how customers respond to them. And this fuels this iterative learning and improvement cycle that allows a product to become better over time. In the world of hardware, of course, traditional hardware development, you develop your product, you build it, you test it a lot. <laughs> because then after you ship it, you really lose access and visibility into that product. Um, you know, once it's shipped, it's done. Once you've, once you've shipped a toaster out to your customers, although I'm sure there are connected toasters these days as well, but the vast majority of toasters, once they've been shipped and installed in a home, that's it. That's the end of the story. And so a lot of what we see as the goal of fleet management tools at Particle is building a world where IoT application development can be treated a lot more like software development, where you can iterate and improve things over time and surprise and delight customers with new and improved experiences, reduce costs of operating those assets over time. Um, and so, so again, that, that's how we think about the ways that we want to arm you all as product creators with tools that allow you to make this transition. And I think uh, Tesla is a really an industry leading example, although uh, uh, Telsa, I guess, is really the name of that company. Telsa is an industry leading example of, of uh, <laughs> applied best practices here. Apologies for the typo. Um, they're, they're doing this really well in a number of different ways. Um, they're using their entire fleet of cars. Autopilot is one of their most popular features. They're using their cars as data collection uh, vehicles in order to gain information to make predictions and then to compare those to actual results, what drivers actually do in those situations, to better improve the algorithm that they're going to continue to sell as one of the key, key uh, marketing points and value propositions of their vehicle in the future, which is autopilot. They're also using their over-the-air software capabilities to deliver new, exciting customer experiences uh, with a simple over-the-air software update. So one of the ones that they delivered this year is a feature called Summon, where you can be standing in, you know, standing in your driveway or, or you know, at a venue that you've driven to, press a button and your car will drive to meet you. 
um, so you can hop in your car from the you know, instead of walking out to the parking lot and be on your way. That was delivered, you know, customers woke up one morning, downloaded that update, and all of a sudden their car could do new things that it couldn't do before, right? And that's a really powerful customer experience that's enabled by these kinds of uh, uh, delivery systems. And then finally, new revenue streams. So again, another example of a, of a feature that Tesla delivered with an over-the-air update is, is a mode called Ludicrous Mode, uh, which uh, is, a, I think, an old Spaceballs reference, um, if, uh, if anybody's a fan out there. But in any, in any case, you know, with a $15,000 investment, your car is now capable of new things. So they're monetizing equipment and features that they already put into the car at the time of manufacture because they've been able to, been able to learn, they've been able to make improvements to the software running on that car, uh, and then they can deliver that again and upsell experiences for customers that have already transacted with them. Um, and so they're selling new features even if they can't sell you a new car. So again, this is, this is a powerful example of how continuous improvement, even in the world of hardware, can create opportunities for customers and for the companies selling those products. Again, so fleet management really is about facilitating iterative learning and improvement. So uh, earlier this year, we, we ran a survey with, uh, uh, that we, we sent a survey out to over 850 professional IoT practitioners and asked them the questions of, okay, in the world of IoT, what's easy and what's hard? And these were their responses. So you can see over on the easy end, things like visualizing data, um, storing data generated by connected devices. Um, but I actually really, I wanna focus on the other end of the spectrum, what's hardest? And the things that they said were hardest were delivering software updates to edge devices and debugging unhealthy devices. So we're gonna talk about a couple of improvements to Particle's platform that really focus on what is hardest about building and deploying IoT devices, which are these two problem areas. So I wanna start first with delivering software updates to edge devices, over-the-air firmware updates, right, which we've just talked about uh, with, with Tesla as, a, as an example. So again, why are these OTA updates so critical for connected devices? This is a, a, a headline comparison between Chrysler and Tesla, who we just spoke about. Um, in both cases, there was a security vulnerability, and the companies wanted to resolve that security vulnerability. So on the left, Chrysler, because they didn't have a robust over-the-air firmware update system, sent uh, pre-programmed flash drives in the mail to their customers to plug into some you know, USB port in their car in order to deliver the update, which in itself is an incredibly insecure way to patch a security vulnerability. Um, meanwhile, Tesla got turned a negative headline into a positive one because within a very short period of time of that exploit being discovered, they were able to build a solution, deliver it, and demonstrate that they are a company that is, that is really at the cutting edge of what is possible with these kinds of connected systems. Customers who are interested in buying a futuristic car that can get, an, that can get a software update a few days after an issue occurs, that's a really powerful consumer experience that changes a negative one into a great deal of positive brand perception. And actually in this headline, they're even compared to uh, Chrysler and how they handle the situation, and so it creates competitive differentiation for them as well. So Particle has provided OTA since we originally launched our development tools back in 2013. Um, and I wanna talk about what makes those, what makes our, what characterizes our OTA system, which is that it is highly resilient, which of course, you know, outside of security, the other headlines that make news in IoT are devices that get bricked because an OTA update went bad. And so, when I say particle updates are resilient, they are atomic, which means that an update is only applied once the entire firmware update has been downloaded and, downloaded and verified to be complete, so that an incomplete update can never be applied to a particle device in the field. There's automatic rollbacks, which means that if that update is applied but the device doesn't reboot, it doesn't uh, behave normally, it doesn't take the firmware update, then it's automatically rolled back to the last known good operational version of firmware that the device was previously running. And finally, there's minimal disruption, which means we download 
the firmware update on the side while your device can continue to run the application that it's running, and then with a very quick cycle reboot, apply the new firmware image and start running the new firmware image so that you have minimal disruption to uptime of the device. Uh, we talked a little bit about security previously, but our OTA solutions are also secure. Every single communication on the particle platform is end-to-end -end encrypted by default, and that includes our, our firmware updates. So um, every single firmware update is sent over that same encrypted tunnel without the need to apply additional engineering resources to make that true. And finally, we have sender verification as well, which means that an update can only be sent by someone who is an authorized product manager uh, for your particle account. So we verify that the update is being sent from someone who is authorized to deliver updates to that product. And finally, it's scalable, which is to say that uh, many of you have probably used our over-the-air features in development, even if your device is sitting right next to you on your desk, and it works great for one device, but it can also, that same mechanism is also scaled to many devices. So you can roll an update out to every single device in your fleet, you can create groups of devices and roll updates out to individual groups. If you want to do a A-B test, for example, or you want to start with a small pilot group to see how customers respond to the feature, you can do so. But the improvement I want to talk about today is a new feature that we've rolled out recently called Intelligent OTA, um, which is a really exciting new addition and improvement to an already robust set of uh, over-the-air firmware update tools. So what are they? Intelligent firmware releases enable scaling customers to deliver fleet-wide firmware updates at the right time. And what I mean by that is, uh, well, let's use this illustrative example. So, you can see on the far left, uh, for example, a scooter. It's running version one of the firmware. And as part of our new intelligent uh, updates feature, we provide a configurable flag on every device that can make it available or unavailable to receive an update. So for example, if it's parked, you might say, okay, that scooter's not in use and it's available to receive an update. When someone jumps on the scooter and starts riding it, in firmware, with a single line of code, you can flip that flag and say, while customers riding the scooter, it's probably not the best time for us to try to deliver an update, right? Because we don't want to disrupt in any way that user experience. So when that firmware is released from the cloud, it's going to scan all of the devices in your fleet to say, OK, which of these are available to, it accept, to accept an update today or in this moment? Then finally, uh, when, that, when that customer experience is complete, the scooter's parked, that flag can, flag can be flipped back to available, and that the cloud will know that and will push the update down at that time when it's safe to do so, and that, and that scooter or that device is safely updated to the new version of firmware. So this allows product creators to be confident, even if they have no visibility into the state of usage of the device, to be able to push an update out knowing that critical services or user experiences are gonna be undisrupted. So um, again, there, there's also a side benefit, which is that uh, for standard OTA, that update is applied when the device re-handshakes with the cloud, which might take, you know, depending on its, where it is in its, uh, in its cycle, as long as a week. So with an intelligent OTA, we're going to push that update out as, as, as quickly as devices are available to accept it, which means that especially for critical fixes that are time sensitive, uh, or, if you, or if you want to ensure that you know, a, an update that's rolled out, you want to verify within a, you know, a business day that the, that the uptake from the selected group is complete. You, you have more predictability over how that update is applied, which is, again, provides options and tools for you as a product creator to, uh, to continuously improve your products. So uh, if you're interested in learning more about Intelligent OTA, you want to know how to apply it to your own particle products, we have tutorials and, and examples and more content available at docs at particle.io. And this is a standard feature that's available to all particle enterprise customers. So coming back to this visual, the, the second thing that I want to talk about is debugging unhealthy devices. And this really is the hardest. 55% of respondents said that understanding when a device was in an unhealthy state and why it was in an unhealthy state is one of the biggest challenge, is rather the biggest challenge that they face in deploying and managing their products. And there's a lot of reasons why that might be true. Uh, a lot of connected products are deployed in remote environments, right? That's why we've connected those objects is because they're 
you know, uh, difficult to get to. They might be a two and a half hour drive away in a, in, a, in a basement corner somewhere. And so depending on where that product is deployed, the network availability might be different. Um, you might have some places that have great signal, some places that have relatively weak signal. You also have a lack of physical access. So uh, just again, what, what I mentioned, a lot of these products are deployed in places that are far away and you can't just walk up to the device, look at a monitor to understand what's going on. And then finally, as we all know, IoT uh, architectures and systems are complicated. They require lots of moving pieces to be working well together in order for a message to be captured and delivered all the way to the cloud. And so when something isn't showing up where it's supposed to, it can be a challenge to understand, okay, where in the process did the solution break? So what usually happens is someone will, you know, someone, uh, perhaps a support individual or a product manager will say, okay, some of our customers are responding that, or are reporting that their units aren't responding. Is there an outage happening? What's going on? And it immediately prompts this discovery process, right? Is this a one-off or is it fleet-wide? Is, is it in my firmware or my application or my cloud side architecture or is it in my partners? How long has this been happening? Are we just hearing about this? Have, has this been an issue for a day or two? Um, and then what do I do? How can I resolve this? And so oftentimes support will talk to a product leader. The product leader might talk to engineering. Engineering might say, well, tell me, give me way more to work with. I, I, I don't know what to do if it's just something's wrong. Um, so where, you know, is there a problem? Let's confirm that. Where is the problem? And then based on that information, let's test all of these different pieces of the stack. Um, let's, let's try to do some controlled um, you know, probing into our architecture to understand what's broken. And then meanwhile, again, of course, the business owner is there saying, okay, when is this fixed? We need to communicate, we need to keep customers informed. And ultimately, this discovery process just results in periods of downtime being longer and oftentimes more frequent. And so that's why we've built a new part of the Particle platform called Particle Diagnostics. This is a preview of a feature that will be available in October. It comes in, in two pieces, Fleet Health, which aggregates fleet-wide uh, device information that allows you to identify and respond to these kinds of system-wide disruptions. And then finally, device vitals, where if you've identified a problematic device, allow you to drill into a, to an individual connected product to understand and collect information about what might be wrong. So here's a, here's a, a, a screenshot of uh, that new functionality which is available in the console. So this is, um, on the left, at the very top, you can see the number of devices connected, your data consumption, and generally a prediction of the state uh, of, of um, you can see all systems operational, predicting that as far as particles concerned, uh, as far as particles aware, there are no issues that would be leading to disruption of your devices. You can see the number of connected devices over time, which gives you a nice visualization of the growth of your product or business. And then finally, some key elements, indicators of health across the platform, event traffic, uh, integration traffic, your function and variable calls and requests that are successful or unsuccessful, and then finally the adoption and uptake of new firmware over time. So you can see, okay, I started rolling out a firmware update at the beginning of this week. My goal is to complete it by the end of next week. Are the, are the issues that I'm seeing associated with particular types of firmware, or is it a broader infrastructure level issue? Again, our goal here is to provide you tools that help you identify more quickly and pinpoint where something might be going wrong. So as an example, this is integration traffic out to Salesforce, as an example, right? So you can see that suddenly the ratio of successful outbound events to, you know, to errored or unsuccessful outbound events suddenly changes, which means, okay, maybe there's an issue with, with the API integration that I've, I've built and delivered connecting Particle's device cloud out to Salesforce. And that gives you a reason and a place to investigate when you know, support, uh, uh, support personnel or, or sales managers uh, suddenly see discrepancies in, or, or a lack of data that they're using to make day-to-day -day operational decisions. Secondly, device vital. So perhaps you've identified, no, it's not a fleet-wide issue, but there are still individual devices that are having issues and problems. This allows you to drill in to the recent history of a device 
and to monitor, again, these critical pieces of information that are captured automatically as a part of devices being on the platform. Signal strength, signal quality, round trip latency, so you can see when uh, signal strength dips below a certain period, you can identify, okay, connectivity might be an issue at this, this site. We should think about maybe adding a cellular repeater or, or tweaking firmware to you know, adjust output power if, we've, if we're managing that. Um, or we should you know, think about repositioning the device so that it has a more reliable connection. And again, you can directly correlate these key pieces of information about the device over time to its performance in the context of your IoT architecture. So you can see that low signal strength might lead to a loss of these events in integration, uh, outbound integration events, and, and uh, function and vari variable requests from the cloud that failed to, failed to deliver. So um, again, these new sets of capabilities are launching in October. Uh, as a standard part of the platform, and we're very excited to see and to improve this product, this, uh, this feature with our customers as this information is applied to more and more real events and challenges that, uh, that you and we face as practitioners in connectivity. So that's fleet management. I wanna shift, change gears a little bit to connectivity and to talk about some of the exciting new tools that we're providing to IoT product creators to connect their devices. So to put this in context, a lot of IoT got a bad rap, especially early on, for building connected price, pro products that had a reputation of really not connecting all that well. Um, and, uh, and this is a real challenge for, this is one of the hardest parts of connected products is managing reliable connectivity. And the reality is that, you know, if you've ever had an, an experience where you went through a subway or uh, you, you, you know, turned your phone on in the morning and you loaded the web page and it just sort of got stuck and so you killed the app and restarted it and it was still stuck. So you put it in airplane mode and put it back off of airplane mode and then all of a sudden things are working again. You are managing device connectivity. And the challenge is that even though this is a regular part of, you know, this is a regular action that we take on our, our cell phones, you know, our most common connected devices, um, that, that, that's a challenge that still exists after you know, a, more than a decade of iteration and improvement but it's also not something you think about because your phone's in your pocket. You can do all the things I just described and it's generally not that big of a deal. But again, with IoT devices, the situation is different. You can't just drive out to a site uh, on a regular basis to put it in airplane mode and put it back, you know, or power cycle the device. And so maintaining reliable device connectivity is challenging, but it's also critically important. On top of that, a lot of providers of managed connectivity are not necessarily driven by the same incentives as your business or your product. So we were at MWC, Mobile World Congress, which is the biggest sort of cellular convention that happens uh, once a year in Barcelona and now happens in uh, 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 smaller events in uh, Los Angeles and in Shanghai. And so the big theme this year was 5G, right? So raise your hand if in the world of, you know, in relation to IoT, you've heard or have done research about 5G connectivity, right, and its impact on IoT. So, half the room. Um, and again, if you attended that event, 5G is here, kind of. Um, it's now, no it's not, uh, and it's real. The, the CEO of T-Mobile would disagree, right? Um, and, and again, the reason that 5G is making such big waves is that, is that network operators are investing huge amounts of money into, their, into their, uh, their connectivity infrastructure. So of course they want you to believe that it's here and that it's real. Of course they want to sell you 5G capable phones because that's how they recoup their investment. And I think being aware of that is really important. Um, again, connectivity is a critical part of your IoT infrastructure, and here is some of the most important players in the industry driving adoption of technologies that fundamentally are not ready to serve the, the, the important role that they do in the context of your business. So as a partner, 
more broadly than as a, as a you know, product provider or a service provider, but as a partner, we see this as an important part of our role, which is helping to provide you with tools, but also the information that allows you to make intelligent decisions around investments and, and uh, uh, investments into connectivity that keep your devices healthy, happy, and online. So if, if you're new to Particle, we offer a range of connectivity solutions that range on the global networking side from Wi-Fi to cellular, and on the local networking side, uh, Bluetooth, which is one of our newest connectivity products that we'll talk about today, and uh, Mesh for uh, building networks, uh, large deployments of, of devices that communicate locally and then shuttle information back to the cloud with the use of a gateway. So to start, I want to talk about cellular. Many of our customers are deploying with cellular, and there's been a lot of uh, changes and improvements to our, uh, as an MVNL, mobile virtual network operator, that we've made to improve the, the, the choice and the, the connectivity op options that are available to you as a product creator. In the world of connectivity, it's not 5G that most people should be thinking about quite yet. It's actually 2G and 3G. So the vast majority of connected IoT products, at least, are connected over these much older technologies, 2G and 3G, that have been around for a really long time. Um, in the US especially, carriers have accelerated the time frame in which product creators have to think about transitioning products from these older but very highly reliable technologies, 2G, 3G, to LTE-ready solutions. So you can see we're here in 2019. AT&T and Verizon are expecting to complete sunset of 2G networks by the end of 2020 and 3G networks by the end of, uh, or rather by the end of 2021, so sunsetting in uh, 2022. And this is a trend that is happening all across the world but is especially aggressive uh, here in the United States. The reason for this is operators are repurposing uh, these, this, this network uh, uh, spectrum for LTE so that as we produce a growing number of phones and LTE-ready devices, there's, there's bandwidth and, and availability, uh, network availability for those, for those new pieces of hardware. So if you're not familiar, the, the trend here is get to LTE. Now, that is a simple statement that gets very complicated if you dig into it. There are a lot of different kinds and, and flavors of, of LTE. And this is just a brief illustration. Um, if you look at the top, you'll see on the side there L, uh, LTE Cat 4, Category 4. Um, and towards the bottom, you'll see CAT NB1, which is also known as MBIOT, uh, above it CAT M1, also known as CAT M, and CAT1. There's a lot of uh, product marketing branding challenges that, that, that uh, this, in, this space has had over the last couple of years. But in terms of the, the kinds of devices that Particle supports, many of them fit into this sort of middle tier here where it's, it's uh, you know, connected monitors, uh, connected uh, equipment, um, that really live in this CAT M1, CAT1 space. And so uh, if you look on the left, you can see the differences, the primary differences between those technologies being bandwidth. So you've got uh, very high data throughput at the top for things like uh, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, and then at the bottom, uh, very, very little bandwidth for things that just need to be sent a message to turn on or to turn off, like a connected light bulb. Generally, Bandwidth, power, and costs all correlate with one another, which is to say the lower down you go, these are applications that are more specifically designed for IoT. They consume less power, which is generally a benefit, especially for mobile applications or battery-powered applications. And cost correlates with power. So the idea is we want to connect everything. Lots of things don't cost very much. And so in order to connect them, we need to provide connectivity of very low cost. Now, as these new technologies have been rolled out, however, the, the situation has gotten increasingly confusing. Um, between LTE and M1 and, and NB-IoT or NB1, these are technologies that were developed apart from one another but are largely designed to solve the same kinds of problems. Um, and so as a result, you know, it's, it's, it's really a repeat of the uh, uh, HD, DVD, sort of Blu-ray kind of situation, right? You have different countries adopting different technologies, and even if within the same country, you have different primary operators driving adoption of, and making investments in different technologies at the same time. So in this world where previously 3G, you could just throw a 3G modem on, throw a 3G SIM card on, and basically expect that that thing would connect anywhere in the world, that's not the case anymore with LTE, and especially with these technologies that are designed for IoT. 
Here's a brief illustration. It can get far more complicated if you go even la another layer down between different primary operators that you're probably familiar with and where they're investing today in 2019. Um, even for a company like Vodafone, that's one of the largest operators in Europe and, and supports these kinds of pan, uh, you know, pan-European products, they might be investing LTE cap M1 in some countries and really driving with an NBIOT strategy in others. So again, this is really disrupting the kind of deployment models that traditionally IoT product creators have followed to get products into market. So again, a, a really high level overview. If, uh, this is sort of the informational part of the, uh, of, of the presentation. Cat1, this is the most mature LTE technology. It's been running, it runs on the same networks as your phone. It doesn't at this point require anything new or different or special for a carrier to do to work. And so, if you're, generally, if your phone has connectivity, you could expect an LTE Cat1 device to have connectivity as well. LTE Cat M1 uh, is one of the newer, lower power, lower cost connectivity options. It supports mobile handoff, meaning it can jump from tower to tower. It's good for mobile applications like asset tracking. Generally, we see investment in North America, Australia, driven by M1. Um, but again, one of the challenges is it's, it's spotty. It's, it's hard to deploy an a, a impossible, I would, I would uh, say, to d deliver a product that reliably connects to M1 networks around the world. And then finally, MBIoT is really has the lowest cost, lower power, will play, I think, a very important role in the world of IoT, but is the most different. Again, I mentioned they were sort of designed in isolation from each other. Whereas M1 is really truly part of the LTE family and the LTE umbrella, MBIoT was really designed in isolation and is much more different, requires new hardware and new software to be deployed across cellular infrastructure in order to be operational. And so our perspective is, even though there's been uh, years of investment in Europe, what we still see is that these networks, these new networking technologies are new and are largely untested. So again, when you're thinking about reliability in the context of an IoT deployment, um, it, is, it is tempting and, 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 and challenging to cite, you know, decipher the, the messaging that you're hearing from carriers and to translate that into the best business decision for your company today. But of course, you know, we, we want to have the right answers for today, but we also want to be able to grow and to be ready for the important movements for, of, of tomorrow. And so, again, Particle can help to decipher this ecosystem and to provide you with a path that allows you to do just that, solve today's problems, but to be equipped with a plan to migrate to new connectivity technologies as they become available and reliable. So in the US, we've really driven with LTE M1. We're very excited to announce our first international expansion of LTE M1 connectivity to Canada and Mexico. So for many of the companies that we work with that are doing uh, North American regional deployments, um, it is now possible to do so with an LTE-ready solution with Particle. So that's an announcement that we made earlier this week in general availability, and we're really excited. This is something that's delivered. If you have an LTE M1-ready device, it can now operate in Canada and Mexico. They're like little, little, uh, little Teslas, right? Um, in Australia and Korea, we're also driving an M1 strategy, and just like we've expanded connectivity uh, from the U.S. to Canada and Mexico, our investing in bringing M1 connectivity to the markets where it's more mature internationally, like Australia, Japan, Korea. In Europe, the situation is much more complicated, um, uh, but uh, pursuing a range of options that include LT Cat1 and introducing M1 and NB IoT options when we have an ability to validate, test, and provide you with the confidence and reliability of connectivity in those regions. So that's cellular, the confusing and complicated world of LTE technologies. And now I want to talk about something that's probably a lot more familiar to us uh, as, as, uh, as uh, technologists, uh, Bluetooth. So Bluetooth really gained popularity, especially in the world of IoT when wearables blew up, right? When Fitbit uh, became a, a, a hugely, uh, a huge company. Um, but I think what we've seen since then is that Bluetooth really creates value beyond the world of wearables. And, and I would, I'm going to provide a couple of examples and, and uh, encourage you all to think about uh, the products you're building and how Bluetooth might provide you with additional tools, 
uh, or, or simplify or improve customer experiences for either your end customers or for the folks that are managing or installing your products. So human machine interfaces, being able to, for, for things that don't have screens and keyboards, uh, everybody has a phone. So using Bluetooth to connect to a device and to operate it or to you know, use it as a dashboard, we see this very commonly, of course, in, in micromobility, but there are lots of other applications for using your phone as the primary way that you, that you uh, uh, that you, you, you use that as the primary interface for the device and for simple uh, command and control of that device. Simplified device setup. This is an example of a premium at-home electric vehicle charger um, that connects to Wi-Fi. Bluetooth, you know, back in the day, the best way, the easiest way to connect a Wi-Fi device was a process called soft AP setup. And you've probably done this before, even if you don't know the name. It's you've got a connected device, it creates a Wi-Fi network, you go into your settings, you connect to the device's Wi-Fi network, you give it your network credentials, and then it goes away, it shows up on your network, then you reconnect back to your network, and then you see if everything worked. Um, there's, early on, there were, there were some really interesting IoT statistics which said that complicated setup was the number one reason for most customers to return connected devices. Um, and we see that Bluetooth has really emerged as the golden standard for how to do uh, device setup, especially in a consumer context. You connect to the device over Bluetooth, you can establish an independent connection that is separate from the Wi-Fi connection you're trying to establish, you deliver the network name and credentials to that device, and then it can test those credentials while it's still connected to your user interface to let you know if it worked. So instead of the device sort of getting lost in limbo, uh, if you fat finger your password, you can instead have a bi-directional uh, connection between the device and the consumer, helping guide them through the process, whether there's success or failure. And that's exactly what this company is doing uh, with this premium charger, is using Bluetooth only for initial device setup. Um, and, and even that experience is, is an important one to consider uh, when you're building your connected product. Connecting Bluetooth legacy, uh, legacy Bluetooth-enabled equipment. So again, Bluetooth started blowing up, and a bunch of device manufacturers said, well, let's throw a, throw a, a Bluetooth connection in there uh, for, as a human-machine interface. Um, or as a redundant way to control and update the device. So there are tons, this is an example of a, um, a blood pressure uh, monitoring cuff, right? Um, so there are tons of devices out there that already have Bluetooth baked into them, and they might be older versions of Bluetooth, um, but if you want to then take a device that only has network, local network connectivity and connect it to the internet so that that information can be uh, pro that can be moved to the cloud regardless of whether or not there's a person with a phone nearby. Uh, you can connect that to a cellular gateway that includes Bluetooth that allows that information to be transmitted on a regular basis. So retrofits are a huge part of, of early IoT. And because so many devices have Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth is also a great way to locally connect uh, a device to a gateway and for that information to get up to the cloud. And then finally, we, we, we've talked about jacuzzi and the use case around diagnostics and troubleshooting. Um, but if you have a very complicated device, like a dental compressor, it requires maintenance, requires repairs. Um, being able to connect to that device locally and say, okay, what's going on? Let me see, I wanna be able to stream the key vitals from that device if it's not connected. Um, and I want to be able to provide more efficient repairs and uh, um, then Bluetooth is, again, a great tool that allows for a high bandwidth, reliable communication uh, between a person and a device to facilitate more effective repairs. So as of this week, uh, earlier this week, we've had Bluetooth available as a part of our platform for a number of months, but as of this week, it's now generally available. Um, and again, API documentation examples, if, you're, if you're, you or your team are new to developing with Bluetooth, um, just like everything else, we try to make connectivity easy, and we've done so also with Bluetooth. So if you're interested, you can check, the, check it out at uh, our documentation site. It supports, a, a, uh, our Bluetooth API support, a number of features, all the Bluetooth roles that, that you'd expect, central peripheral broadcaster observer, uh, multi-roles such as, you know, functioning as, as both roles simultaneously, multi-links, meaning you can connect multiple peripherals to a single uh, central device, uh, it has the benefits of being Bluetooth 5.0 ready, which means you get increased data rates, longer range, and uh, improvements in, in broadcast capabilities. And 
some, I won't dive into it, but some improved software under the hood that helps to navigate congested RF environments to provide the most stable and reliable connection possible. All right, so last I wanna talk about hardware. Even just in the number of examples that we provided today, it's clear that the goals of IoT products are widely varied and that they come in many different shapes and sizes. And so at the end of the day, what we believe is that a one size fits all is a losing strategy. So something like a scooter might need the smallest possible size, lowest possible cost, but really only needs to exist for a year or three um, before it's repaired or recycled. Um, or, you know, in some cases, I guess, thrown into rivers, things like that. Um, something, uh, uh, on, on the flip side, a use case like stormwater management um, might instead need to exist in very harsh environmental conditions, might have to have the highest degree of reliability possible, and might have very long asset duration. So you put this into the field and you need, it to, you need to know that it's gonna be functional for years and years and years. These two different use cases might require very different hardware solutions, and Particle is taking our connectivity offering and providing it in multiple packages so that you can use the format that makes the most sense for your product. So we provide three different form factors, development kits, which are for generally rapid iteration and deployment, what we call our castellated SOM or system on module line, which is for industrial grade, highest possible reliability. And then finally, a new form factor, uh, our M.2 form factor, factor which provides, it's, it's uh, plug and play and, and provides the maximum amount of design flexibility. So why might you use one versus the other? Um, oh, I should add, they're all designed for future compatibility, so we'll, we'll show, share a little bit about the roadmap in the future, uh, in, in, in just a second. But why might you use one versus another? So the development kits uh, come in a, a form factor standard called Feather, which, is, which provides a really rich prototyping ecosystem. Feather is a standard that Particle has adopted, but was not created by Particle, which means that there are companies that build accessories that match this same pinout specification. So if you want to buy a development kit from Particle and then add functionality very quickly off the shelf, you've got 50, and, and at this point it's probably actually closer to 100 compatible accessories that work out of the box and are compatible with the pinout of our development kits. It also provides a very complete feature set. You have LiPo power management and onboard, onboard antennas, uh, mode buttons and status, status LEDs that let you know the state of the product when you're developing with it. And finally, it's fully certified for consumer grade deployments. So can actually be used in these sort of limited production grade employment, uh, deployments um, and, and facilitates this very rapid transition from this prototyping world into, into a production world. Our castellated SOMs, again, these are about maximum durability. Uh, they have an extended operating range from minus 40 to 85 C. They're vibration and shock resistant because they're physically soldered to the board. Um, they, they include also a very rich uh, feature set, including LiPo power management, and you also, though, get complete access through the extended pin maps to the full range of uh, GPIO and peripherals on the microcontroller. So if you're connecting up a lot of sensors and you need every you know, last GPIO that's available on the device, then this form factor might make sense for you. And finally, it's certified for industrial grade deployments as a result of that extended operating range. And then finally, our new M.2 SOM form factor. So the benefits here, you can see that little gold row of pins at the bottom. The way that this connects to a baseboard is through a connector that forms essentially a temporary connection to, between the connectivity module and, and the device. And when I say temporary, what I mean is that it's removable, it's swappable, so it's secured by a, by a screw so that it can't come loose accidentally, but if it needs to be swapped out, repaired, exchanged, it can be. So, uh, that, that's what we think about as field upgradability. It also has some of the uh, additional systems removed, like power management, uh, because lots of IoT products don't require a LiPo battery. 
uh, and have solar power or have lead acid power. So by removing some of those pieces, we're giving you the most flexibility to be able to provide your own power system that makes the most sense for your product and not have to pay for you know, the additional ICs on board to be able to plug a LiPo battery in. Um, it's a standardized connector pinout, which means, again, it's future-proof. We provide the same, uh, the same standard set of connectivity peripherals for all of our M.2 capable devices. And that might make sense in these kind of mixed connectivity employments where you have Wi-Fi for some products, cellular for others, and can simply drop in, even at the time of installation, the right connectivity model for your, for your application. It has 64, it actually has the most number of pins of all of our products. So again, it, you have complete access to GPIO and peripherals. And again, it's also certified for industrial grade uh, deployments at that extended operating range. Our first M.2 SOM will be generally available later this month, which is a cellular SOM called the B402. Uh, it connects LTE M1 and Bluetooth capable. It connects in US, Canada, and Mexico, as we previously discussed. Um, but if you're interested in learning more today, we've got design resources and samples available upon request. Um, reach out uh, to us either online or, or there are plenty of folks here that would be happy to uh, help you get set up with a sample so that you can evaluate our newest form factor. In those form factors, we have two different generations of hardware uh, that, that I want to briefly describe. Generation two is our, our uh, photon and electron lines, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, which is single radio connectivity, either Wi-Fi or cellular. Um, and, and if you aren't already aware, we have a new generation of products available, generation three, which provides those same connectivity options plus Bluetooth as a standard feature by default. So if any of those use cases from before resonated with you or your product, then all of our generation three products have Bluetooth included by default. We have that available uh, in Wi-Fi, cellular, and mesh-ready solutions that all include Bluetooth uh, functionality for setup and, and for other uh, cool interactions and features. So this generally is our roadmap. Um, again, we can make these slides available to you, so, so uh, feel free to take a picture, but no need. Um, we can make them available to you after this event. Um, and really the message that I want to overlay here, rather, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but what I want to communicate is you can see the newest generation of hardware featuring that new M.2 form factor. For those of you who have already adopted either our development kits or our castellated form factor, we're providing forward compatibility and a transition path so that, again, through this, in this idea of building for today but being ready to grow and evolve into tomorrow, we see that as an important part of what our hardware can do for you as well. So regardless of what form factor makes the most sense for you, we have a path forward, we have a solution that can grow and evolve with your product and with your business. So that's been a lot, so I just want to leave you with a wrap-up, a recap of what we talked about today. New management tools like intelligent OTA and uh, improved diagnostics, fleet health and device vitals. New connectivity with LTE M1 here now available across North America and Bluetooth and general availability, as well as our newest form factor, our M.2 SOMs, that give you the flexibility to choose the right form factor for your product today and to grow that product into the future. Thank you very much for your time. If you have additional questions, find us after the event. Thanks.